Today is November 27th, 2004, and I, Nathan June, along with my grandmother, Norma June, are interviewing Donald Gertzey in his home in Del Mar. Mr. Gertzey served with the 10th Mountain Division during World War II. Oh, hold on. Um, the lens cover is still on. Let me just... Well, our place of interview was at home, 40 Elton Avenue, Delmar, and it's uh, about 10.40 a.m. Okay. And you're the name of interviewer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Donald Bercy, and uh, I was born in Albany, New York, in December, or no, I'm sorry, January of 1925, long while ago. Uh, what was a pre pre war education was high school. Occupation, student. How'd you hear about Pearl Harbor? Well, I heard about it in the news on a Sunday afternoon. The attack took place on Sunday morning, I guess, and it was well known all over the world when President Roosevelt gave his speech about the day of infamy on uh, December 7, 1941. Uh, I entered the service after high school. I was allowed to finish that year in high school. I mean, I was allowed to finish the year that I became 18. So I went to service in July of 1943. And I came out in 1946 in February. <clears throat> I was drafted. We tried to enlist. I wanted to enlist in the Sigma Corps. But uh, they said they were doing things like quota. So at that time, we had certain quotas in certain areas to fill and was unable to enlist because they said, go home, boys, and wait for your letter to come. And that would give you your assignment and where you're going to go. There were certain ones drafted the Navy and Coast Guard, and Marines, and Air Force, et cetera, et cetera, depending on their level of intelligence and whatever, you know, which they determined from your school grades. So, you're all right. <laughs> and uh, so I was drafted. I went down to, uh, my training took place in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where I was trained as an artillery mechanic, which meant I was in, to be able to repair or replace parts in field guns, which were the howitzers and, and long guns, anything up to 155 millimeter long gun. The type of howitzer that I was more familiar with was a 105, which was called the Queen of Battle because it was so versatile, it could be moved around so easily. It had a split trail on it that opened up and set it quickly. And it had a, a sliding breech that uh, when you enter the projectile shell into the tube, the breech was slid to the side, and it was just took a flick of the hand to close the breech. And as it fired, it came back in the, in the recoil position and then went forward. And as it came back, it, it expelled the shell casing that was in there, and it uh, Projectile, of course, had gone. The casing came out, and if the crew was working well, they'd have the next projectile ready to put it in and follow it right through up into battery position where it was ready to fire again. The breach closed and pulled the cord, and away it went. The German soldiers wanted to know where we got the automatic 105. It was not automatic, it was hand loaded. So that's just it worked. The machinery of the gun was so easy to operate that it just was as fast as it come back and recoil and up the battery, bang, it went off again. And uh, artillery, as you may realize, is a softening up used, not now anymore, they use helicopters now, but uh, all the gunships. But anyhow, the, uh, the artillery was usually sent in to do a lot of softening up on the enemy's lines, wherever they may be, or on their roads, or on buildings, or whatever they were housed in, to uh, demoralize them. <coughs> and the way artillery was set up, was that you had three types of uh, projectile. It had the, the uh, one that went off and hit a solid object, which uh, exploded immediately upon touching anything solid, like the ground or a building or whatever. Then there was armor piercing, which was the kind that would go through a brick wall or would go through the side of a tank even and explode internally. And the third kind was air burst, which was set by a timer. 
So you can imagine a softening up action where all of the artillery is firing in different modes of firing point detonation, which goes off in the ground, to something else, which is delay fire or armor piercing, which goes off inside of a building or underground, and time fire, which is above their heads. I don't want to be there. And that's all happening. But that's what the softening up action was with artillery. <coughs> don't do it anymore. Anyhow, my job is to keep functioning. <coughs> and in our action, when we were overseas, we had six howitzers, which were known as a 75-pack howitzer. It was a uh, small gun, could be disassembled, and loaded on the backs of six mules. And that's where we waited, made our way through the mountains, but not in combat. When we got in combat, we became the mules. We carried all the parts of that gun any place they wanted to go. <laughs> the mountains of Italy were a lot of different from the mountains of Colorado. They were cold. The snow was more slippery because it was wetter. And the uh, temperature was just uh, sloppy and wet. Damp, very cold, you know, damp and cold. Not like today. Today is fairly good in these drier weather. But anyhow, that's how we got to be the mules by dragging those armor with those uh, pieces of uh, equipment up into the mountains. Our adversary was the German army, and they were again surprised that we could bring artillery up into the mountains. He was next to surprised that we could bring in anything more than hand grenades and mortars. But when you bring artillery in, your range is greater and your firepower is much more effective. So that's what artillery does. <coughs> Artillery goes back a long ways, and people who are in the artillery are known as red legs. Reason? <coughs> Any artillerymen dating back to the Civil War on their uniform, both north and south, had a red stripe on their trousers, commonly known as the red legs. The thing came out of the Turks during one of the wars with the Charlemagne and all those guys that were running around down there, and Alexander the Great and all of the Turks identified themselves as artillery by wearing red pantaloons. Therefore, the name Red Leg came to be. But it doesn't mean anything now. There's no more artillery. <laughs> that was the history of artillery. But we did, uh, we did do well with, uh, with our endeavor to take away the uh, Apennine Mountains, the Po Valley, and the lower part of the Alps before the surrender came. Now, that tells you what branch of service I was in and why. Uh, I didn't say why. Okay, when I finished my training at Fort Bragg, I was interviewed and said I could have four choices. I could go into the engineers, which I qualified for. I could go in the infantry. I could go to officer candidate school, which I had enough high to level to, to qualify. Or I could go to a new division forming in Colorado called the 10th Mountain Division. And that's where I enlisted. And decided to go. Got out there in January of 1944. Temperatures about 14 below zero. Wearing clothes like we got on here. With this white jacket. Everybody said, what the hell did you volunteer for something like this for? <laughs> Shortly after we got our warmer clothes, the barracks were very cold. You can't, you couldn't leave a bottle of water like that set overnight if you froze it out and broke the next morning. That's what temperatures we live with in the mountains of Colorado. <laughs> was, there a, some, huh? was there a reason why you chose the 10th Mountain Division? Well, yes. For one thing, it was art, they were looking for artillery people. And I had been schooled in artillery mechanics and knew artillery pretty well front and back. So I'll well, stay with it and see what happens. Well, didn't know how things were going to be in combat, but you find out very quickly how it is. Mm -hmm. So you were assigned to a job to do, and you do it, and you, you just wait it's over with, and you're, you're done. And the biggest thing is, you want to go home. There's no greater pleasure a soldier has than wants to go home. That's it. You got girlfriends back there, and so many I had a wife that I married in 1944 before I went overseas, and I wanted to get back home for that too. Actually. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I, by the way, this is my first wife. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 60 years ago. <laughs> All right. Medals and citations and where we see there's not too great a thing about medals and citations. Most all fellows got them. And mine, this is a picture 
and put together, pass it over there with the patch of the Pentagon to be here. And that picture was taken in front of St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. Supposedly St. Mark, according to legend, St. Mark, the, uh, the apostle, is buried in that cathedral. And that's in St. Mark's Square. The picture was taken by an Italian photographer who was very enterprising and wanted you know, get pictures of all the soldiers who came to visit Venice. This was after the war. We weren't allowed to uh, travel before that naturally because your enemy was in those places. The medal surrounding this, the picture in the center was just coming loose. It's a good conduct medal, the red one, red ribbon. Everybody gets out of you, stay out of trouble for 90 days. <laughs> for good conduct medal. So it's no big deal if they give you that to start you off. Then the other one, I believe, is uh, with blue stripes on it, uh, Asian, or no, uh, African. Mediterranean, European theater of operations. <clears throat> Another one there is the uh, uh, Victory Medal. And by the way, if you look closely at that, you'll see a picture of uh, the one standing with a, a globe in her hand, I believe. Oh, yes, yeah. And where's the foot? Um, what do you see? On top of the sun. Huh? Looks like it's on the sun. On the sun? Or a helmet. That's right, it's on the helmet. Okay. A helmet. In other words, it's, it's suppressing war. Ah. Lady of Peace. Yeah. It's very nice. Yeah. Now, the American Eagle, as you know, you see it on your dollar bills, has arrows in his left hand, but palms in the right hand. Indicating the United States is a, is a country that dedicated to peace before the That's conflict. Nice. So I could probably tell that I was there with the unit, and I was not injured, not hurt in any way. A couple of scratches, but I didn't didn't qualify for any uh, Purple Heart. But there was a lot of our guys that did, yeah. and they were well earned. A lot of them were very badly injured. And the uh, German army was dedicated to holding what they what they had in their possession. But our job was basically <coughs> <coughs> was to take from them the Apennine Mountains, which are in northern, secure the Po Valley, which is a low, flat area, the Po River running right to the middle of it, and then go into the Alps, where they had strong fortification. Uh, just beyond the Alps, right, uh, their German country and their occupied countries. But in order for our planes to bomb that far into Germany from it, places in Italy, they had to fly over two mountain ranges. In those days, the planes could not do that. With a full load of bombs and a full load of gas, they could not make it over two mountain ranges. So our job was to secure one mountain range and the whole land beyond so they could put air bases and refueling bases in between. So they could land in one place and refuel and then start again. So that was unnecessary because the Germans saw fit to surrender because of the onslaught was so great and the bombing of Berlin became so great and intensified. In May of 1945, they decided they were not going to continue the battle. Now, our greatest feat was Mount Belvedere, which was a large mountain in Italy where they had highly fortified uh, artillery. And along the side of that was known as River Ridge. Well, those places were regarded by the German army as impregnable. But since our training brought us into climbing mountains up sheer slopes, we had one regiment of infantry that prepared itself the night before and as soon as dawn break broke to climb that sheer, sheer straight slope with the aid of pitons and climbing ropes. And they the top of the mountain before dawn. It was a foggy day and everything was going well. They were not even allowed to load their weapons because a misfire, a shot going off, would reveal soldiers in that area. So they had to carry ammunition in their pockets. 
and they got the rifle empty. So if they encountered anything, they had to load the rifle first before they could fire. But they didn't carry any hand grenades because if one of the pulls and the pin fell out, boom, the thing goes off. You reveal your position. <coughs> the artillery and two other regiments of infantry made it up to slate the slope to keep them occupied early that morning. It was foggy, as they said. And they were overwhelmed by this amount of soldiers coming up. And they were not allowed to fire rifles either. The reason is they fixed bayonets. So to have done do your enemy, you had to bayonet them or throw a hand grenade. The reason was, if you fired your rifle in the early morning in the, in the fog, you would see a muzzle blast of fire from the tip of the gun. They knew where you You didn't fire your gun. You waited for them to fire and threw a hand grenade. <laughs> Overwhelming. You know, that yeah. was just the manner in which our commander decided to take that mountain ridge. And it worked. It worked so well that <clears throat> the commander of the German forces, who negotiated the surrender with our commander, wanted him to accompany him to the surrender table because he thought so well of his tactics. His military tactics were superb, and he wanted him as his escort. Now, commanding officers do this. They recognize each other's talents and, and objectives and how they overpower them and overcome them. So he was very happy to have the, our commander go with him to the surrender table. Now, that was in 1944. In 1994, a group of our guys who were still able, not me, <laughs> but who were still able, went back over Italy, which they had made trips before and reunions, etc. But they went back over to Italy and at the <clears throat> expense and the invitation of the German army of today, they did a reenactment of the Battle of Mount Belvedere. Only then, when they reached there was no hand grenades, rifles, and so forth. <laughs> there was lines of beer barrels and balonies and worst and bread and tents all set up. There wasn't a sober soldier for three days, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> including, including, you know, the German soldiers and the American soldiers who were able to do it. With the aid of the present 10th Mountain Division, which is stationed at Fort Drum in Watertown, uh, they did the climb. Not the straight climb. They went around a little bit. <laughs> but they had climbing ropes and they had pit times. And of course, these guys were in their, you know, their 60s or 70s or, or 70s or 80s. 1994. So they uh, realized that they were not going to be able to move as fast as they did and whatever. But they did reenact the scene and retook Mount Belvedere again. Now Belvedere is a pretty well-known name around here as well as the 10th Mountain Division is. But uh, Belvedere uh, was a significant, significant place that we kind of hold dear in our hearts. And on February the 19th of every year, we gather. There are 19 chapters throughout the Mountain Division. And we gather at different places and just celebrate that day together. You know, those who can come and have a, have a few drinks and a dinner and so forth and enjoy each other's company again. No war stories, and we had enough of that long ago. It doesn't matter 10 years anyhow. So that's what we did. Now, the last one we had was this past February 19th out at uh, the Great Western Hotel, Motel, Diner, restaurant on uh, Route 20, Western Avenue, just uh, like full of road. So we had maybe, uh, I don't know, 25 or 30 guys there that came again and brought their wives and actually, you know, they're invited now. We got to bring them along. They go to reunions all, all over the place. <coughs> So that, while we were there, telephone rang, and the, one of the hostess of the hotel came to me and said, are you Don Gersey? I said, yes. She had a telephone in her hand, no cordless phone, and she got a message for you from an officer in Germany. Well, I knew right away who that officer in Germany was, and I got her picture here. I said her, and that's what I mean. Uh, the gal in the center is from Ithaca, New York. At that time, she was known as Colonel Becky or Colonel Rebecca Halstead. 
in charge. She was with the 10th Mountain Division at that time. We met her up in 2001 up at the Fort Price, White Face Mountain. White Face is one of our assembly points around here that we go to because mm -hmm. the guy in charge of White Face Mountain was a 10th Mountain soldier. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's how it was. <clears throat> Anyhow, Colonel Becky identified herself just the same as I'm telling you right now. I'm Colonel Becky, and she was a discom officer up there, and her job was to handle and make sure all of the supplies, equipment, mail, and came in and out of Fort Drum was properly taken care of and handled and distributed and whatever. From there, her new assignment was with Army, and she was sent over to Kaiserslautern, Germany, where she again assumed the same responsibility. Only now, she didn't have a division only to worry about. She had the European theater of operations, including Kosovo, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. All of the supplies, equipment, and mail, and, and is it in and out or back home again? Those countries. She's now a brigadier general. So, Mormon, can you reach that big picture right down there by your side? The uh, framed picture. Mm -hmm. Down on the ground, on the floor. That's <coughs> it. That's it. Pull that up. That's one of our new 10th Mountain Division soldiers who is now a Brigadier General, graduate of West Point, and is the first woman graduate of West Point to gain the rank of Brigadier General. Wow. So she's gone down in history. She joined in 1977. She enlisted and you know, went, was taken into West Point and thereby enlisted. So she is now holding that rank. We get communication from her now and then with Expect one pretty soon around Christmas time. <clears throat> so we're kind of proud. That's her mother and father, by the way. And her mother was the one that institu instituted her thoughts about getting an appointment to West Point when they first accepted women. So away she went. <clears throat> so she also can wear the belt of a general officer. Now, I think but that belt is only worn by general officers. It's a leather belt, very made. And that's to identify them from the rear as well as the front. Wow. So if you see a general officer walking away from you, or a person felt like that walking away from you, you'll know if it is a general. So be prepared to get that to the <laughs> <laughs> That's enormous. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my daughter bought this for me. This is a 10th Mountain Division soldier of today. Oh, really? Yeah. <clears throat> I bet you were, uh, were your, was your gear a little different back then from today's so Yes, <laughs> yes, very much so. In oh, fact, when we show the video there for a few minutes, I'm not going through the whole thing, but that's called Fire on the Mountain. <clears throat> ah, okay, let's go through a couple things here. Oh, incidentally, the government of Italy thought so well the 10th Mountain Division, that they had a plaque installed on the top of White Face And these are not people from the, from the, uh, directly, but pass that along. And that picture is, none of you knows who they are. top of white face where you don't know, the ski slope begins lower now. Yeah. But uh, the very top of white face is that ball. But cut into that is another piece of stone and the flat stone. <clears throat> the stone is from Mount Belvedere, where we have the fiercest battle as I told you about no no ammunition and guns and so forth. And the plaque is a dedication to the tenth mountain division for their effort in freeing Italy from the accident uh, regime. Wow. So the Italian government had this plaque put in up there. So they're going to white place mountain. Way up on the top and they'll find this plaque. 
<laughs> Incidentally, I told you, 19th of February gathering, and the phone call. Well, I had sent Colonel Becky at that time a letter saying that, that we were going to gather on the 19th, and of course she had known about that in her three or four years with 10th Mountain at Whiteway, or at uh, Fort Trump. So lo and behold, from Kaiserslaut in Germany, I'm talking to Colonel Becky, who congratulate all of us guys who gathered together up there. She figured out at 12 o'clock noon, or every time she had to make that call from Kaiserslaut, she did it. And we all passed the phone. Everybody got a chance to talk with her. She was well pleased that she could talk with us. So yeah. That's the way we kind of lose together. <laughs> yeah. They hold on to each other. She's very, very supportive of the town. Her letters say, I want to get back again soon. I hope to see her. By the way, when we left our company, at, or her company, after taking some pictures, she said to me, when you were in the service, all your officers were men, right? And I said, yeah, they were. She said, well, did you ever have an urge colonel? And I says, no, but I do now. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so we embraced a little bit, so did her, and uh, didn't see her again until we heard she was in Germany. And then she's now stationed in Wiesbaden, and from there to Iraq, maybe in Iraq or now, I don't know, whatever. But uh, <clears throat> last communication I sent back to her and congratulated her, and I said, well, you asked me if I wanted to hug a colonel, I said, now I'm waiting to hug a general. <laughs> 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 Never did that before, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure if there are more questions here. Now, you were a corporal during your time in Italy, right? Well, no. <laughs> I didn't get the rank until I was back here. Oh, okay. But I was doing a, I was doing staff sergeant work as artillery mechanic. Yeah. Because it was my job to see that all the ammunition was in place where it should be and all the, all the, and the gun was properly working. We had six guns in a battery, three firing battalions, and three battalions in division. So there was, you know, quite a few numbers of firepower there. So a lot of people were counting on you. Oh, yeah, they were counting on us very much. And then we had core artillery, which was and firing the big heavy stuff, but we didn't care about too much. They could make, they made once in a while, they close. <laughs> well, friendly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the battles, did, were you, uh, were you present in them? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. There was, we were active with it. There were some hairy things going on then. Yeah, yeah, you did. And when you first saw your first casualty, it was, a, uh, it was killed. You just have to look and say, well, that isn't me, and keep going. You just have to form that kind of mental attitude because, you know, you, it's just like seeing a terrible accident on the highway. So, it's terrible. And after a while, if you saw a channel, I'm just glad it wasn't me. You know? yeah. So that's the attitude that just automatically fills your mind that you have to say, it wasn't me. So, and you go on and do your work, but you have to do it. I hope that you guys can help the other guys too that are with you. Now, uh, let me see, what was your ownership assignment out there of operations? I told you quite clearly. How did you feel about combat? You were there, you had to do it, and you were happy that it was over with, and just thought, I'm glad you were the victor. Your adversary was there, but they were human beings also, and you had to know that they were suffering the same way you were. They had casualties, they had lack of food, they had lack of war, they had lack of clothes. You know, everything was affecting them as well as affected you. So you had to realize they were a human being. So you had to treat them as such as prisoners also. Not like they're doing nowadays and chopping heads off and crap. Uh, how do you keep in touch with those at home and how often? Probably once every four or five days when you got a chance to write a letter. Mail was free for soldiers, you didn't have to put a stamp on it. You just wrote free on the top of the envelope. I don't know if they still do it or not, but <coughs> the, the people who sent you letters uh, uh, had to put a stamp on it. But the uh, one disadvantage to it, all of your mail could not be sealed. An officer read it before he left your your, your uh, division area. It was, and if there was anything in there, they felt it was revealing to anybody where you were and what you're doing, and, you know, that, that it was necessary to keep quiet. These scissors cut out. So we got a letter with a lot of stuff cut out of it. 
that's been censored, and that's, that was real. That's the way it is. Donald told me about the, the things rolling down the hill that you thought were hand grenades or... Oh, potatoes? <laughs> yeah, it turned out to be potatoes. Yeah. One of the places we found, that, well, the Italians were very frugal people. And when they farmed, if they had a hill, they couldn't use it for anything else, they terraced it. They had terraces. And they planted potatoes in there. You know, carrots or anything that was down, a, a root type of vegetable, you know, would grow down the ground. Well, it was in a fairly deflated position where we didn't have too much action at the time. And this happens because your armies have to regroup and move and regroup again. Uh, at this time, it was pretty quiet. So I'd gone up the top of this hill for some reason, and it was toward dusk. And they on the hill, and I see when you're coming down the sandy soil there, this was in the spring near the Po Valley. <clears throat> coming down, the ground kept breaking away. And I wondered what it was. I thought, I hope it wasn't hand grenades. I was kicking loose there or something. <laughs> Buried in the ground. Or they were potatoes. Nice, white potatoes. I mean, you had skin on. So I gathered up what I could, took them back. We were able to build a fire. So build a fire and roasted potatoes. Well, that was the best meal we ever had in weeks because we ate C rations and K rations. <laughs> A lot of guys went crazy over back in the day. <laughs> 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 and every once in a while, a friend of ours who was in our division, or in our, uh, our, <clears throat> our jury unit, lived in Sally, New York, near Syracuse, and he was Polish, and his mother made kielbasa. Have you ever eaten kielbasa? But it's a highly seasoned bologna-like thing. So, you know, well, it's Polish by origin, I guess, and she made several sticks of it. And uh, packed in a shoebox and never come through. Well, nice thing he couldn't eat at all. He used to share it with the rest of us. <laughs> well, after the war was over, we had, we didn't know it, but one of our units had uncovered a German warehouse full of cognac and uh, champagne. So they weren't allowed to have it, but we could. But it was rationed. You only got a bottle. You know, you got champagne, you got cognac, whichever they had enough of to pass out. So every soldier got one bottle. Well, this was in the foothills of the Alps. And there was a river ran through there, a very, very cold stream, as you would expect in, you know, the Alp streams. So we cooled our bottles in the streams. <laughs> First time I got drunk, I got a bottle of con or champagne so fast like that, I didn't know what happened to me. Because now she didn't have any alcohol of any kind. So, we buried these things under the stones of the, of the uh, stream and got them to put in coal. And we broke open Kasikowski's box of kielbasa. And boy, did we have a feast to you know, kielbasa and coal. <laughs> Soldier will do anything to get something different to eat. No matter what, no matter what great what he is or where. You know, even officers will do the same thing. But anyhow, we had a good time with that. But that was where the potato field came in first and then the bottles of champagne and cognac. <coughs> uh, food, we couldn't complain about it, but the only thing about army rations, they come in, of that big, maybe not now they don't, because meal, meals ready to eat. But in those days they had packages which were called pay ration, and it had a can inside, it was either filled with cheese or like, uh, like Spam, and crackers, chewing gum, Five cigarettes, and I forget what, but it wasn't too much stuff in there. But you could have crackers and spam or crackers and cheese or whatever. Uh, you would get three of those a day. But it didn't mean that you got breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You might get three breakfasts, yeah. you know. So you might have nine of them in your rucksack. You're cracking around. You swap with other guys, you know, to get yeah. a variety of food. So. But it was good food. It was very concentrated. Had a lot of items packed into it. And even on those days, back in the 40s, they knew how to do it. The result was you had very little body waste. In other words, you didn't have to go to John very much because your body burned up all the calories it was supplied you with this food. It was good because.
course, you only go out and the only way you had of disposing that was dig, digging the slit trench. And you just squatted down over the slit trench and did your stuff and on a twig sticking up out of the ground with it like a goat stuck a roll of toilet paper and that was it. You know? <laughs> if you could, in a place where it was near a town or something, you might put a tarp around it. Any place else, you're out in the open you know, with the winds and everything blowing up. <laughs> doing your thing, but lucky for these rations, you didn't have to do it very often, but your body burned it all up. So the food was okay, but we came back from overseas, <clears throat> came back to Camp Patrick Henry in Virginia. First thing they offered us was a turkey dinner. Nobody could eat all of it. Our stomachs had shrunk yeah. and you're eating the smaller amounts of food. <clears throat> you find as the people go on a diet, that's why they can't eat big amounts of food. Their stomach shrinks. It absorbs what it gets. You don't have to grow any bigger. <laughs> it doesn't stretch. So you can't make it stretch right away. You can later, but you know, it'll move out and you'll get bigger. <laughs> but anyhow, that's what you do. <clears throat> Supplies were okay. You sometimes had to wait for them. But it has a way of doing things. Don't fix it till it breaks and then just give you a new one. You know, you don't worry too much about fixing things. How do you feel about your military experiences and why? Well, I guess I just told you all that. I'm, I'm proud to have been in service. And I, I know that our adversary, as well as, as those who served with us, felt pretty much the same way. And I told you about the beer party on top of Mount Belvedere. It shows you that they're just humans. And you want to have to talk to them. How you feel about the use of the atomic bomb and why? At the time the atomic bomb was used was when our unit had been brought back to the States and was scheduled to go to the invasion of Japan. I probably don't have to tell you any more than that. When the atomic bomb was used, we didn't have to go to Japan. We go home. <laughs> so where do you want to go? You want to go to Japan or you want to go home? <laughs> <laughs> President Truman just Drop the atomic bomb, Japan surrendered, you don't have to go there anymore. Yeah. So you're going to go home. Hey, that's great. You know, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> that sums it all up as far as personally. Yeah. No more pay rations, right? <laughs> I hope they never, never, never have to use them again any place in the world because they're a terrible, terrible thing. And I don't think any nation that has any common sense at all wants to do anything with those things, or nitrogen or whatever <coughs> bombs they got. <coughs> How did you learn about VJ Day? Well, I, I wasn't home, I don't think. No, I was just doing some service. And what we were feeling, we just thought we were very, very happy about that. European theater, were you aware of concentration camps? No. I knew they existed, but I didn't know the extent. I learned about that later on in the stories that were told about the concentration camps. And uh, all movies like Schindler's List and so on that you found out really, really what terrible things that happened there. Did, did those kinds of things upset you after you learned? Oh yeah, yeah, actually, you know, it's just a thing that's being treated in such a way. And another story I can tell, which had nothing to do with military, it had to do with a German soldier who was uh, an American, came over here after World War II, uh, lived right here in Del Mar and worked with me at the high school in the custodial department. And he and I used to talk several times about our experiences. And he said when he was a young man, he was not conscripted until he was 40-some years old because he had a family. But uh, Hitler was getting down to the point where he needed everything he put his hands on. He, he was, he was uh, conscripted. But he, in the town that he lived in Germany, they were marching some of the concentration camp workers back and forth. And he said they were so thin and so malnourished and everything. He said, I actually cried. I couldn't believe that men in my country could do things to such a human being. You know, he couldn't believe that actually you could do that to a person. He said, to mistreat them so badly that they could barely walk. And they were beating them with their rifle butts to keep them going. He said, they fall down, they kick them again and go on again. He said, they said, it was hard for me to think that my fellow man would do something like that. He says, I just would think of my own children, if they were Jewish, what would happen with them? You know, you didn't choose your religion, your, your uh, ethnic background when you were born. You were born into that, and that was what was happening. So 
So even those of Germany, the people of Germany, the citizens of Germany, were not happy with what, they, what was happening in concentration camps, and that was my reaction as well as his. And how did you learn about VE Day? Well, VE Day was victory in Europe, and I was still over there at that time. Very happy that that happened because then we were human beings again. We weren't hitting each other. Uh, what did you do when you arrived home? Well, it took some time for being around to see family and friends and so forth, and then went looking for a job. Uh, first job I got was driving a bus with what was then the United Traction Company. And I uh, was with them for 11 years. Their pension plan was not all the best, so I began to think about other places, so I learned of an opening with the Bethlehem Central School District, so I started there. Uh, have you attended reunions? Yes, I have. When and where? Well, one of the big reunions we had was up at Fort Drum, and that was, what, ten years ago, maybe? Yes. One? When and where? How did your military experience change or influence your life? Well, it changed because I don't have to worry about it anymore, and it influenced my life and what I can tell the stories of now. But the association we had with each other and the, the members of the 10th Mountain Division. And other Army units too, I mean, it doesn't only single him out. But <clears throat> one of the experiences I remember at Fort Drum, the commanding officer at the time introduced one of the former commanders who was now retired and wearing civilian clothes. His name was General Meade. And by the way, he was a red leg too. So in his former days in the military, he was a red leg. But he was commander of the 10th Mountain Division at the former time. So when he was commander, he instituted the four-mile run, which excluded nobody. Everybody, even chaplains, ran the four-mile run. <laughs> there was no exclusion whatsoever. You start out maybe with a half, and so forth and so forth. Well, the natural thing to do was to invite General Meade back to the, uh, to the reunion. And uh, uh, I think his name now, the commander at the time. But anyhow, he said, I notified General Meade about six months ago that he was being invited to this reunion. And when Meade spoke, he said, I was so happy to get this invitation so long in advance. Because in the letter he told me that you instituted this four-mile run every morning, which, which excluded no one was still doing it. So when you come on post, expect to run four miles. <laughs> <laughs> Even general officers have their fun with each other. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, that was John Magruder. So he says, I'm happy that Lawson Magruder called me early enough that I got in shape again and begin to run every morning until I got up to my four miles. He said, because after all, I led you guys in four mile runs. He says, now they tell me I got to go with you. So <laughs> he had been retired for about four or five years, but I'm going to do it again. So they did. And Broder says, yeah, he kept right up with us. He and I were right up there in the front, running our four miles every single morning, rain, shine, snow, whatever it is, they're out there. They got to run their four miles. So this is what military people do, who help front each other. Anyhow, uh, most memorable experience, I guess that's when the war ended. And we were told that we didn't have to move any further. It was a, a, a eye-opening experience, I'll tell you. Of course, when we fired our guns, we had a motto that have to pardon my French, but the saying was, shoot shit and get. Because if once you fired your weapons and you got your pieces in foot and your effective fire, you packed up and got out of there. Because it didn't take long before counter battery fire was coming in against you. As soon as they got your location pinned down and they got armaments set up enough that they could fire back, naturally they're going to hit back. So shoot shit and get. You know, don't be there too long because you're going to expect some more. <laughs> Heavy artillery coming back at you, which happened a few times. <coughs> but then, oh, for battles in front of 
chronological order. Well, that's it's only two I can recall. I got the on the picture that I showed you, me and Ben. Uh, there were two battle stars on one of the ribbons, mm -hmm. and one was for the Italian command, Italian camp, which was and the Po Valley campaign, which I don't know why they separated the two, but they did, and they got a battle star for each. What we liked most about the battle stars was the fact that they were worth five points. And five points that you added up more into your discharge. You know, uh -huh. so when you got more points, you got sooner you got your discharge sooner. Yeah. So now I guess it, it works a little bit different. Now with three purple hearts, you can go home. You know, like, you get, you get out here with that. So, <coughs> about that. How did you, you know, when you got home, how did you feel about the, uh, GI Bill. Did you take advantage of it? No, I didn't. I didn't use that, nor the, uh, you know, the buy a home or to go to college either. So by that time, uh, well, I'd been married two years, and we figured we'd start a family. So by 19, came home 46 in 1947, our first daughter was born, our only daughter. And uh, then in 1950, our son was born. So we started a family. That was one of my goals. Uh, this is a little map of the areas around Italy where we had our combat. So, from the other mountains, where you, did you open fire with artillery? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you could take a mountain peak. Yeah. Well, I mean, but these are the mountains of Colorado that we trained in. Some of the places, <clears throat> like Aspen, Colorado, and Cooper Hill, which are ski areas now, were training areas. I mean, it was Cooper Mountain, we call it, or Cooper Hill, as we call it. Yeah. And now it's Cooper Mountain. Uh, the unit, when it was formed, was international. This man with the lights on here and holding the skis was Tortle Topol. He was a famous ski instructor and uh, jumper from Austria. Wow. When the division first formed, a lot of the people, a lot of the men were from right around this particular region in the Adirondacks. And they were of the uh, National Ski Patrol. Hmm. And it was at the time that they developed division knowing that they would have to have <coughs> a division capable of handling mountain warfare which meant to advance up through Italy, Po Valley and the Alps. So we didn't know how far they would have to go in the Alps, but that's what we decided. But surprisingly, <coughs> the the tour of Italy was wet and sluggish. We never used skis or snowshoes or mules. <laughs> wow. Handle everything by hand and uh, the skis were just non-existent. Non so all that ski so and training was All that training that we did with the skis was was not uh, used at all. Uh, did you a, use horses a, in the mountains? Or just uh, horses? Not as much. That's a summer camp. In mountain no. Uh, there were horses, but they're only used in the, in the flatlands. Mm -hmm. They're not capable of handling mountain work. You know, mules are very sure for it. And a mule will go any place a man can go without using his hands. If you can walk through a place or climb a place that you don't have to grab onto something mm -hmm. you, and help yourself along with your hands, a mule can do it. But if a mule lays down and he has a full load of whatever's on him, supplies or equipment or, or you know, armament pieces, he won't get up until you take it all off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He won't get up till he's naked. Sorry. <laughs> so he gets all that weight off him, then he'll try, he will get up. Then he'll reload him again. But they will not get up. And if they get tired, the mule stops. The horse will run and it breaks his heart. I mean, they'll, they'll have a heart attack. But the mule won't do that. And the mule won't drink cold water either. If the water's too cold, he just snorts it away and he'll wait. Because he knows it's going to hit his stomach and he'll get a bellyache from it. They're really a smart animal. Yeah. And we like them in the mountains of there. Of, of Colorado, because as you went up a mountain, you're leading a mule, 
<coughs> they had a halter on there on their head, leather strap, hold on to it. And they pulled me, they pulled me, they pulled you along. <laughs> they weren't supposed to do that. No soldier's going to walk up the mountain alone, but he's got a mule pull him, so yep. he's going to that arm, pull him, and uh, lead him up. The setback about the mules was you had to take care of them first. You had to feed them first, you had to unsaddle them and rub them down, curry comb, because their, their fur or their hair would mat underneath the heart of the saddles, and they were pack saddles. I think you picked you one here, but anyhow, the, uh, the hair would mat down, and under that matted hair could be a saddle sore. So you had to inspect and see what the... This was a, a picture of the camp, called Camp Hale. In Colorado, it's not there. It's only the bases of the are there now. But that's what's around us. Wow. <laughs> and the, uh, so he inspected the mules for the saddle sores and combed them down with a curry comb and brushed them. And they'd stand there all day and let you do that. They really love you, like petting a dog. You know? And you feed them, try to pick a line, and uh, then go take care of yourself. The mule was the first thing. And we were told very bluntly, the mule cost $150. The soldier cost $1. Oh All you got to do is send a letter out. That was the comparison we made. We used dog, dog flakes, not in combat. And then mules, as they called me, these were mechanical mules made by the Studebaker company. But we didn't use them in combat either. We just used ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Best weapon you could have, right? Uh, yeah, we were lucky we had ourselves to rely upon. The yeah. nicest thing about the mules is if you had guard duty, everybody wanted to pick a line. Because you got in between the mules and kept warm. You know, the bodies of the mules radiate heat. And get in between the two of them, you put them together and stand there they are. Arkansas, Missouri, that's what the size of you, almost as big as a horse. Wow. They are. And to qualify for the artillery, you had to be five foot ten or better in height to be able to load those mules. The word off on there is very significant. Unless you want the stars kicked out of your head, you never approach a mule from the offside. Approach him from the near side. Mm. Horse the same way. Use the lead a horse with your right hand. And you mount him from the right side. And you put your left foot in the stirrup and you mount and swing over. Don't ever try to load a mule from the other side. They'll take it right around the circle, knock you down. They <laughs> just don't like it over there. I don't know why it is. They'll let you do anything else from the, from the near side, but the offside is. No, no. Yeah. So conditions probably must have been pretty awful at times over there. It was. It was very awful. And the sad thing was about the civilians that were not taken care of as well as they could have been. Well, yeah, you know, they were taken care of as best they could be. This I'm not going to bother with, but this is a roster of the names of the fellows who was in the division who are still alive. Uh, some have passed, I'm sorry, I should have said that. Uh, their name, address, telephone number, their wife's name, and, you know, all about them. Well, not much about them. So we can keep in touch with each other no matter where. And it's all set up by states or in uh, districts. So the uh, division has done well. There's a organized, as a, as a, a uh, an infantry unit only. Mm -hmm. And it first saw action in Kiska. The island of Kiska is in the Aleutian chain, and it was thought that the Japanese had occupied it. And they did. They had fortifications there, and they were planning to come in through Alaska. Mm -hmm. And they had planned to bring supplies and ships in through that way over the Aleutian chain and bring uh, ships, small ships along that chain and sail down to be close enough to the American coast in Canada, or be close enough to Canada and the United States to be able to fire projectiles into like California, etc. Yeah. So. 
but it didn't happen. They didn't have time enough to get set up in the Aleutian before they were discovered. And the first charge of the 10th Mountain Division, only as a regiment, was sent to Alaska. And by the time they got there, the Japanese had learned they were coming, they got out. So they didn't have any combat. But there were several soldiers killed up there. The reason being because they didn't know that they were gone, and some fired on each other. Because they were, the wind and the cold was so great that when they hollered, and somebody kept moving, they hollered, halt again. And by the third time you holler, halt, your order is to fire. Well, they hollered, halt, the three times, and the person, in fact, the commanding officer was one who was shot by one of his own troops. Wow. And just didn't hear the word, halt. And they expected it was going to be enemy. It wasn't enemy, it was just so those mistakes do happen. Did mistakes happen over in the Alps like that? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. There were times when they were bound to make mistakes. First thing, you move so fast and you got so much stuff to move around. You don't know where you are. You're in a state of confusion about 90% of the time. You know? yeah. All you know is that you've got to get up to a certain place and get your job done. And you hope that your officers know what they're doing. They're going to get you there in proper form. Yeah. So that's about what is the, the one picture they have that's in. Uh, I don't have the book right here, but the picture I have is uh, done by an artist. Let's see, he was in, <laughs> he did in the Stars and Stripes, which was a daily or a weekly newspaper for the, uh, for the armed forces. And he uh, drew this one illustration, and it shows a little, little uh, Italian girl standing with it. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, she's, I think she's barefooted, scarcely dressed, and she's probably about six years old, and she's got a tin cup, you know, a pail. And so the gruffy looking GI, you know, soldier, uh, coming from his chow line, where we did get hot food once in a while, and he's got his mess kit, and the, uh, the title underneath is The Prince and the Pauper, the Prince being the soldier and the Pauper the child. So it was one that took, world, <coughs> took notice all over the world. But now, <coughs> some of the soldiers in Iraq are even having food and uh, toys and candy and so on sent to them, and they're distributing among the Iraqi children. So there is feelings. No matter where you go, just feelings, you know, mm -hmm. in the way. But you can't feed everybody as you're. You know, you only had them three rations, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to need them for yourself. But if there was extra rations, and actually you shared them. If you took prisoners, the prisoners had to have the same food you got. That's the, the rule of Geneva Con Convention, that uh, whatever your prisoner, wherever you took your prisoner, and whatever you were eating at the time, if you had hot meals, they got hot meals. If you had rations, they got rations. You know, there was international law said you must feed your prisoner the same what you're eating yourself. Which is good, because you could be taken to prisoner too, and you hope that they would treat you the same. Yeah. So those things do happen. Japanese yeah. never signed the convention. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. So not they, sign uh, the things they did to American prisoners are yeah. almost unspeakable. Oh, some were terrible. The, the, the Battle of Bataan was off in the Death March. So I belong to the VFW and the American Legion both. And this one article here was from the most recent. Um, uh, no, 2003, March of the, the VFW and the 10th Mountain Division leads the way. The division now is not for mountain warfare, but it still holds a name traditionally because history. But it's now the most rapidly deployed and most most usually deployed division of the of the of the army. And they're looked upon as <coughs> Get there in a hurry and do the job and get out again. Mm -hmm. Each uh, quarter of the year, our newspaper is published. And as you remember, we told you much about Camp Hale. They called it the blizzard. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what our... It's a good name for that. Good name for it, yeah. Uh, tells about some of the things that are happening. And, uh, that's the kind of a rucksack and pack you are when you're on skis or snowshoes. Yeah. 90 pounds. 
90 pounds of rucksack and an ounce of rubber to it. He went sure to the mountain like your daddy used to do. <laughs> but this is... Did, did many from your division, when they got back home, um, set up, like, ski lodges or...? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there were several who did. Uh, Mount Cranmore in New Hampshire. It was set up by one of our soldiers of the 10th Mountain Division. Incidentally, Robert Dole. Robert Dole was a uh, soldier in the 10th. That's how he was so severely injured with his shoulder, being almost torn apart. But, well, let me see. Oh, at, at uh, Fort Drum, there's a monument which our units paid for. It's $55,000. It's a statue depicting the soldier of today and the soldier of our era, one helping the other climb the mountain. Hmm. Hence the motto of the division was climb to glory. So anytime you communicate one, well, you sign your letter, climb to glory. Yeah. So, in fact, General, Becky always closes her letters off with that to climb the glory. One of the ways. They think that she probably what what our mentors think about her over in Europe, that she'll probably be the first female four star general before she leaves the service. I don't know how long she intends to stay in, but you know, she's got she's got soldiering in her blood all the way through. And she is, does well. <laughs> Anybody that can get all the mail supplies, equipment, whatever, throughout the entire European theater of operations, that includes female supplies as well, you know. Well, just to survive at West Point at that time. Yes, yeah. it was uh, start. Yeah. Uh, almost unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, those first uh, women cadets had it really, really rough. One of the funny things happened with me, it wasn't funny, it was it paid off. <clears throat> when I was at <coughs> uh, what did I Oklahoma. Fort Sill? Fort Sill. It was one of the artillery bases down there. Mm -hmm. Biggest, one of the biggest fort track. While I was at Fort Sill, there was a whack contingent in there. And their barracks area was all enclosed with barbed wire, or a cyclone fence with barbed wire on top, like they were prisoners. You know? And they were well guarded, you know, because Actually, there was a lot of guys who had strange feelings. <laughs> Might sneak in there at night and have fun or whatever. But it was well guarded, and you had to have a pass for an escort to go in. Well, a sergeant that I knew in the tent, this was after the war. I was a corporal in. I had a squad room, and he and I shared this one room. So, woke up on Saturday morning, and Sergeant Sad, his name was, S-A-D-D, -D, he said, Hersey. How would you like some blazed donuts? Oh, boy, sound good. Okay, he had a car on base. He wasn't a 10th Mountain soldier. He was part of the cadre at Fort, at Fort Sill. He said, we're going over to the wax barracks and have, have breakfast. And I said, yeah, all right. He says, I know a friend of mine is a mess officer over there. So over we went. Of course, he had his pass, so I could go in with his car with him. The MP at the gate gave me a temporary pass use while I was in there. But it was limited in time, you know, like three hours or something like that, you gotta be out. <laughs> so, <clears throat> those girls were well protected. So we went to the barracks for the, the mess hall, and I was surprised. We had to wear uniforms. The wax could dress any way they wanted to, at least in the morning. <laughs> they had to put their uniform on after nine o'clock or whatever. <clears throat> But they were coming into the mess hall in pajamas and slippers, you know, like cozy slippers and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> I could wear it all. <laughs> and bunnies on and anything like that. And they had to be covered. I mean, they couldn't be revealing. But they come in in pajamas or a nightgown or a robe or some hair and curlers and all this kind of, oh, what a messy looking girl they were. So anyhow, they sat down at the table and Sergeant Sad goes in and he gets a tray full of uh, donuts sets in front of me and I've already got my coffee. So one of the girls 
Well, they all did. They sat down at their tables with their breakfast. You all went to a chow line. Nobody got served. They always went chow line. So, the yeah, sat down across from me, and I didn't know her from Eve, you know, so I said the way it was, and I came aside and said, well, you ought to come off, and I was okay. So, didn't think any more about that. Of course, there's like hundreds of them, you know, you don't select one out of hundreds, you know, especially when they look that bad, you know, so <laughs> just leave it alone. <clears throat> I had no intention of making any, any passes or nothing. So, that was on Saturday. Next morning, I went to the Post Chapel, which I had probably had to walk about a mile and a half to get to. So I went to the religious service, Protestant service, and I came out. <clears throat> Standing outside, I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do next. And I knew the PX was about a mile back toward my barracks area. All of a sudden, this female soldier comes up alongside me. <coughs> and she says to me, are you done? And I said, yes. Didn't you have breakfast at the wax barracks yesterday? Yeah, I did. I sat opposite you. Well, here she is all prim and proper with a uniform on. I know she looked really dressed decent. But that day, she, you know, hair and curlers and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Didn't make any kind of appeal to me whatsoever. She's just a person to talk to. <coughs> so she said, where are you going for lunch? And I said, well, I don't know. Time I get back to our barracks, it's going to be over with. You don't feed you after a certain time. You tough luck, so you're too late. So I guess I'll go down to PX. She said, "Would you like chicken and dumplings?" I said, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> she said, "Well, you can come over to the wax barracks again. I have to be arrested. Stay with me the rest of the day. You can't go anyplace else. You get a pass, and that's it. Okay." Huh? We went and had lunch. Theater. Each paid her own way, 15 cents. I don't know what the movie was. <laughs> we both went to the post theater and just talked about home and she was to Mark and so I guess. <clears throat> so anyhow, we just compared our lives and whatever, you know. So time to leave, my hour was up or whatever. So off I went. Next Sunday I went to Post Chapel and I looked around for her. <laughs> she, she was there. So, over there to Wax Barris again. So Almost every Sunday that I went to the Post Chapel at Fort Sill, she'd be there, and I'd go to Wax Barracks and have dinner, because I could only get a hamburger or something for the PX. So that was one of the benefits I got from being a good religious person. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing more. I got a good meal every Sunday. <laughs> <coughs> Not overshadowing our cooks. It was a good guy. They did some real good things. But they were that was made in, in Colorado. Wow. Now, who was the pastor down there at the Lutheran for the Methodist Church? Evans, his name was. Bob Evans? Is that it? Adam. 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 Bob Adams. No, his name is David. David, David Adams. David Adams, okay. His wife helped Susan Graves make that statue. Oh, yeah? In Colorado, yeah. I mean, I knew she was from Colorado. Yeah, one time I mentioned 10th Mountain Division, she came over to me and she says, have you seen a statue at Fort Drum? I said, yeah. She said, you know the name of Susan Graves? I said, yeah, she was the architect. They cast that bronze statue. Oh, and she says, I helped her with that. That came apart and they chipped it by pieces. Wow. Huh? So she helped with that. So they, you, you, you run into people all over that. Yeah, I guess have so. Have a benefit to you. He had uh, he had trained with the uh, oh uh, what are those um, top military outfit of uh, Rangers? Huh? Rangers? Rangers. Oh, Rangers. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, there's another name for them. Airborne. No, they go to the school. Ranger. Yeah, Ranger yeah. School. He had gone to Ranger School. Uh, Adams had, and uh, and he broke his ankle or something about three quarters of. Uh, spent quite a bit of time in the hospital. <laughs> he said he had to go start from the beginning and go all the way through ranger school again. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. really, really rough. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he, he was an officer, second lieutenant, and by that time they had stopped sending uh, uh, officers to Vietnam. It was winding down and they didn't want to 
uh, waste officers over there. And he said he was always very, very glad that it happened that way, that he yeah. didn't have to see and experience the things that has torn these men to pieces so yeah. badly. Right. But uh, I guess he was, <coughs> he was a pretty tough soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, this book, we're not going to even open. It's the Combat History of the 10th Mountain Division, 45, 44, 45. Wow. If you want to read it, it tells every single order and fact that took place in the combat theater for what the 10th did. And the numbers in here will just be overwhelming. You read the numbers, so forth, the wow. location number and all that. You know. yeah. I know why I bought it, but it was one of the things that you could buy. And, uh, and it tells about the different units and what this is. It's the uh, adjutant's record. Task Force Darby, you know, they call Our commanding officer was uh, General Hayes, and his, uh, his building up at Fort Drum was known as Hayes Hall, where the command center is. And he, uh, he was the one who engineered the attack on Belvedere, Reaver Ridge, and the Bow Valley. <coughs> but uh, he was a an artillery officer, <laughs> and Bragg Battle too, an artillery officer in World War One, And I guess he had a of horses, artillery officer. Mm -hmm. The commander rode a horse, and the, the gun was drawn by <coughs> six horses. So they were uh, you know, familiar with horses more than mules in that, that time. But he's said to have three horses shot out from under him in combat in World War One. So he knew what combat was, and he uh, did well as commander. Division and, uh, and his one of his statements was when he asked his commander, who was in Naples, how far do we go? He said he took a map and he had the map of Italy and he put a thrust line on it. And a thrust line is what the commanders use is where they're going to be moving to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he said. Well, I see the thrust line ends at the top of the map here, into the Alps. If we get to the Alps, where do we go from there? You get another map and you mark it again, and the thrust line goes to Berlin. <laughs> you don't stop when you take over. Maybe things worked out. We didn't have to go to Berlin, yeah. and it was much better. Of course, you know all about the invasion and all that stuff in Normandy and whatever. And that. Hitler says, boy, we got them right where we want them now. We're going to kill them all off in no time. Then. But he was pretty well wrong in that. <clears throat> well, thank you for so, your time. Okay.